Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm very happy to see all of you, and uh, I will uh, would like to just tell you how I'm planning this talk. So first of all, it is not a talk about string theory or theoretical physics. Uh, it's a talk which I, I, I hope to make you think a little bit uh, about the connection between basic science and applied science. So I assume that all of you or most of you are engineering students. Am I right? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Okay. And uh, so I want just I just want to make you think. I, for the purpose of student festival uh, is for you to be exposed to some ideas which will stimulate some thought in your mind and uh, which will help you to go on to new. Okay, so I will talk for about 20 minutes first, and then I'll pause for some questions and discussion. And I would really like it to be interactive. So, is that okay with you? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Good. Uh, in between, also, if you want, you can interrupt me. But anyway, as I said, I think first about 20 minutes. So now I'm going to share my slide with you, and then you won't see me. You will see the slide. So just give me a second. Um. I have to do conversation share screen. Let me know if you can see the. Okay, so this is my. I suppose it will load in its time. Uh, my title is Relevance of Irrelevant Science. And the reason for this title is because people think uh, that the basic science search is done in our science institute. Uh, as a nation society, and I have to draw a line showing how basic research is connected to society. So that's my plan. Now, I'm getting my voice in feedback. That's not very good. If you do something, you maybe make it a little softer there, something. No, but you know, ah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, one thing you can do, maybe you can mute your own mic. So that I don't get any feedback for the 20 minutes, and after that I'll ask you to unmute. Is that okay? Good. Wave your hand because I, I can see you in the camera. So just wave your hand if I'm uh, if you're not hearing me or any problem. Okay. So I'll start. So my starting thought is what is the capability of human beings to think beyond their own lifespan? You know, at best we live you know, 760, 70, 80 years, 90 years for some people, is it possible to think of society beyond the length of that span? And for that I always like to show this picture of a very, very famous monument. I wonder if you can recognize it. If any of you know what it is, please put up your hand. So either you are not hearing me or you don't know what it is. Okay, this is the Angkor Wat. This is a famous Hindu temple, the largest in the world, and it is in Cambodia. And it has a very interesting history. Uh, it was built, it was started in the year 1113 uh, by one king, King Surya Varman II. And he only lived uh, 37 years. But it was completed by King Jay Varman, who was the 7th, who was born in 1181 and uh, died in 1218. He also lived only about 30 some, 37 years. I don't know why everyone there lived 37 years. But you know, lifespans were not very long in those days. But imagine that a temple was conceived and planned and started under one king, and several kings later it was finished. How does that? How is that even possible? How can a person think, I want to do something which will outlive my lifespan? And when you think like this, then you understand the purpose of basic science and I want to convince you of that. Okay. So there is a Greek proverb, a society becomes great when old men plant trees in whose shade they will never sit. So here is a little cartoon, uh, it shows in the first frame, a father watering a little plant and saying, Son, one day you will truly appreciate the important things. You will appreciate the truly important things in life. And in the next frame, you see the son uh, with his child uh, swinging from that same tree. So that thought process is what I am trying to talk about here. Now, let's switch from Cambodia to an institute which is currently uh, considered one of the most, let's say, intellectual, leading intellectual places in the world. 
This is the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. This is where Einstein spent the last decades of his life. And this is where many important discoveries were made. But I want to share with you a thought from the founder of this institute who was Abraham Flexner. He was no scientist. Uh, he was actually a sort of businessman. But he founded this institute with certain beliefs. And here I have written down what he said. Throughout the whole history of science, most of the really great discoveries which ultimately proved to be beneficial to mankind had been made by men and women who were driven not by the desire to be useful, but merely the desire to satisfy their curiosity. This is a statement of Flexner, the founder of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And to pursue this idea and this goal, he brought Einstein, but also many other notable physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, people of all walks, all professions, even people are working in literature, even the poet T.S. Eliot was in IAS Princeton during this time. Now, let me cut from that thought to a textbook uh, called Introduction to Physics in Modern Medicine. Now, I'm assuming that you are not medical people. I am also not a medical person, uh, but uh, it was very interesting for me to read in this book that no easy dividing line exists between curiosity-driven research and applied research aimed at a useful biomedical outcome. And you see what a paradox there is. Curiosity-driven driven research, you do just to learn something. You don't care whether it will benefit people or not. Biomedical outcome, on the other hand, means it better be useful to cure patients and save lives. But they are saying there is no easy dividing line between these two things. So I want to ask the question, where did modern advances actually come from? And this brings me to the basic theme of my talk. Uh, before I continue, can uh, I see one of you in the front row. Can you just raise your hand if the sound is good? Yes, sir. Oh, very good. Thank you. Okay. So I am going to make a list of some modern advances and I am going to ask you, I am sure many of you work with these things, I am going to ask you where did these things come from and why are they so recent. So you see on the screen computers, mobile phones, telecommunications, cryptography, novel materials, GPS positioning. So these are six things and I am sure that you have used all of them in some form or other, okay, computers we use, I am using one right now uh, to talk to you, mobile phones of course, telecommunications I am also using to talk to you, interact with you, uh, cryptography you might know that when you, whenever you do online banking or online purchase, which I am sure that you do, you are using cryptography because that is how the password system works. Novel materials, pretty much everything that you buy or use, even the computer that I am using, the laptop or the aeroplane that you fly in, the latest planes like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, they are made from different materials from what the older planes or older computers were made from. So, novel materials. And GPS positioning, I don't have to tell you what it is. Okay, now that is a list of six modern advances. Now, in the right column, I am showing you six more which are all medical medical imaging like MRI scan, laser surgery, ultrasound, keyhole surgery, topical cardiography and radiation therapy. I am sure that one way or the other you have heard of all of these. Possibly uh, not you because you are all young and hopefully in good health but possibly people who are older than you like your parents or relatives or me uh, have used uh, various of these things in order to recover from some illness or to treat some problem. So, where did all these things come from? And here is a sort of uh, couple of uh, pictures just to illustrate these new advances. So, the way I want to phrase the question is, of course we know these are all transforming society, they are saving lives, they are improving our well-being. You know that all governments in any country must support these kind of advances because this is what makes people happy, this is what improves the quality of life. But where did these things come from? And the question in red, why are they so recent? Now, I realize that most of you are born in the mid or late 1990s, am I correct? So, 
you don't probably know the era when these things were not there. But even for you, there are things which are there in the last, let's say, 3, 4, 5 years, which were not there when you were, say, 10 or 12 years old. Even the reach of internet was not, in 2005, it was not what it is in 2017. So why? So let me list some questions. We did not have x-ray scans in 1850. Okay. Uh, Here is a picture of a broken skull. I am sure people were breaking their skulls even in 1850, but they didn't have x-ray scans. Uh, in order to hear music, when I was the age that you all are now, uh, we used some scratchy plastic discs and put a needle on it uh, to play the record and hear the music. Until 1982, that was basically what we had. Now here is a picture of a computer in 1965. And I'm not sure of the details of this one, but I'm willing to bet that my iPhone has more computing power than this whole thing, which fills up a whole room. There were, of course, no mobile or smartphones in 1980. Here's a telephone of that era. Uh, some of us and probably your parents will remember these kind of dial phones. I'm not sure you would even know how to make a call with such a phone, but uh, this is what it was. So you see things have changed rapidly and my question is why? So I am going to run you through a few histories of a few uh, basic science discoveries and I have listed four of them but I don't have time in this talk to cover all uh, of them in detail. I will spend a little more time on x-rays and then I will tell you briefly about lasers, general relativity and prime numbers. X-rays have brought about a major revolution in medical imaging. We will see that. Lasers, of course, have done so many things. There is no limit to how many things lasers have done. But I will focus on the medical application, which is for surgery. That is just one example. What does general relativity do for us? Uh, it plays a crucial role in global positioning systems. And what do prime numbers do for us? They impact our use of security, passwords and banking banking transactions, which obviously have to be secure. So these are some brief histories and I will start with x-rays. Now here is a picture of a guy with a long beard and this is a German called Wilhelm von Röntgen and in 1895 he was pottering around in his lab doing studies on electrical discharge from vacuum tubes. Now Röntgen was no medical person and he was least interested in the outside world he was a sort of model crazy scientist who had a lab. He wanted to understand the properties of matter. So he wanted to understand that if I heat some material in a vacuum, then this discharge which comes out from it, what does that discharge do? What does it look like? What is it made up of? What are the elementary constituents of matter? These kind of questions. And he accidentally discovered something new, which was which we know today as X-rays. And you probably know the name X was given because we didn't know what it is and x is used for something that we don't know. It's like the variable in mathematics. So the first x-ray photograph ever taken here I've got a picture for you was the hand of his wife Anna Bertha Ludwig and you can see her wedding ring on, on the ring finger and she screamed when she saw this and said I have seen my death because until that time the only thing the only way people could see bones was to look at real skeletons, which are obviously are dead. So she, for the first time, saw her own bones in this picture taken by an x-ray. Now, just this image I am showing you required 90 minutes exposure, which is actually quite harmful. Okay, And uh, people of those days did suffer harm because they didn't know the damage of the technology. But we know today how to control that and we know that the benefits of x-rays are much greater than the damage that they cause. Now, let's see what use they were put to. 1895 was the year of the discovery and this is the status of surgery in that period. So I've got a textbook called The Mechanics of Surgery which gives a description of how bullet wounds should be treated among many other things. Okay, so imagine there's a war. In the war there are soldiers. Soldier gets a bullet wound and has to be carried away. If the soldier dies, that is the end of the discussion, but many soldiers will survive if the bullet wound is in their arm or leg, not such a crucial place. 
What did the surgeon do in order to find the bullet? The bullet might be embedded inside the body. It would be very painful and if it's not taken out, it will cause infection and that in turn can lead to death. Now, the problem was, let's say I have a wound, like a hole in my leg and I don't know if there's a bullet inside or not. How will I find it? And the surgeons of that time used to take these probes, which you can see in this textbook picture, and poke it inside the wound and move it around to see whether it's a bullet or just a bone that they're finding inside. It was extremely painful, unpleasant, unsanitary. Uh, I, can, I can assure you that if you have an injury, this is not how you want doctors to look inside your body. And that was the state of things. And by chance, and many wars were going on in this period, and uh, this concept, how to probe a bullet wound, was being improved, but it was always being improved in the same way. Namely, how can we poke something inside the body and find out whether there's a bullet there? But no one imagined that you could see through the body without poking anything inside it. And that's what the X-ray does, as you know. And then, right, fundamentally research, to take more to society and all the people working on medical solutions. It is absolutely impossible to quantify today or to imagine society without x-rays. Okay? For every little thing we take x-rays, even for everything we take x-rays and this whole, but you know, the more important application is really the medical one because anything that's wrong in your body, you need to see without opening the body. Now let me turn to lasers. Lasers were invented by physicists fascinated by the properties of atoms and light. The original idea actually came from Einstein himself in 1917 using the quantum theory which had just been newly discovered. And the idea was that you can take a certain kind of system and pump it in a way which excites all the uh, radiation uh, all the atoms inside the inside the sample such that those atoms together can emit radiation in a coherent way, in a way that's mutually organized. So all the atoms emit light at the same time and the light which comes out is powerful because all the light particles come out in depth, hmm, in phase. Now Einstein 1917, it took 41 years uh, for even a proposal how to make such a thing. He simply gave the basic science idea. He didn't propose how to make it. But the scientists and this proposed how it can be picked up they didn't either. And then uh, when I was um, yeah, in KG uh, kindergarten school, the first laser was built by this man, Theodore Miner. And it was a prototype, it was not something that you can put in it's a pointer or in your smartphone or anything else, but at least it was a working prototype. And here I want to show you the entire paper. This is the published paper of Theodore Miner, the whole paper. Hmm? It's just that long. It has two figures and three paragraphs, uh, and that, that's the whole paper. Now, I don't know how well you can read this on the screen, but please see where he was working. Can you see? Please put up your hand if you can see his affiliation. Yeah, can you read it? Hughes Research Laboratories, a division of Hughes Aircraft Company, Malibu, California. So, a company which is dedicated to designing and making aeroplanes pays this guy to sit in a lab and make laser without any idea what the laser is going to be useful for. And here we are talking 1960. What happened since then? Okay. So this is the also this is uh, another this is the paper of of the concept and this paper if you see from 1958 also see the affiliation this is Bell Telephone Laboratory New Jersey and if you read this abstract I don't know how well you can see it you won't find any reference to medical applications to benefiting society to making uh, laser weapons or laser guidance systems or laser anything hmm? there's no reference to that it's just question of how, what is the behavior of resident radiation in optical character. So they didn't discuss any possible application of this technique, let alone socially relevant applications. And despite this, the basic research which they did was funded by industry. 
And today we are in slightly different times. Uh, industry is a little bit less involved in fundamental research and particularly so in India, unfortunately. But I'm ho I hope that this will revive when they read this and, uh, and understand how we got where we got today. So see where we have reached today. This is a list only of the medical applications of laser that is not even complete. Hmm? On the left, in the left column, you can see a bunch of different kinds of laser. Eczema laser, dye laser, excuse me. <laughs> dye laser, react laser, argon laser, copper, gold, helium, krypton, ruby, etc. Hmm? And on the right side, you see what kind of uh, applications, starting from LASIK surgery, which is used uh, for people's, uh, to, to, to improve people's eyesight, uh, going down to skin resurfacing, hair removal, uh, ophthalmological, photodynamic, uh, glaucoma, various different things, lithotripsy. These are all very important techniques and they are used in hospitals everywhere, including in India. But it could not have been in the mind of people in 1960 that this would happen. And by the way, please go to Wikipedia. This is taken from there. And this is his own medical app. You will find pages of other applications as well. Okay, now I'll briefly run through general relativity and prime numbers and then we'll pause for a little face-to-face -face discussion and then if there's interest, I'll continue from there. Hmm? So, Albert Einstein, as you probably know, proposed a new theory of gravitation which went under the name of general theory of relativity and this was 1915. Now, this theory described the law of gravitation in a new and difficult mathematical formulation in terms of which it is described by the curvature of space-time. Now honestly, even though I work with this theory, it's very difficult to understand what is the curvature of space-time uh, because space, space we can understand, if a space is curved like the surface of a ball that we can understand, what does it mean that space and time are curved? But we do have equations and we can use them to calculate things. Uh, and is that it's not just to understand um, the structure of gravitational force, but it's actually needed for very practical applications such as GPS. So in the bottom right corner, you can see a map of my institute taken from Google Maps. I'm sure you use Google Maps straight around. And uh, it's a fact that if general relativity were not understood, then you would typically be one of one or two or ten kilometers of your mark, which is be very useful GPS. And the reason is that this very, very abstract and difficult theory of gravity allows you to compute small corrections, small corrections to the basic data that is fed into GPS, and those corrections are due to the bending of the light signal due to the gravitational field. And it's extremely important to know it's because of the relativity that GPS works. Of course, general relativity is useful for many things, but this is a social application that you can use that's in your own hands that you can use with the smartphone. Okay. To number three. And we know what prime numbers, so I don't have to tell you. And prime numbers have been studied for centuries. But many of the breakthroughs in this subject were made in the 18th, 18th century by Leonhard Euler, who was, uh, who was Swiss, and whose face appears on this Swiss in Frank note. Uh, he lived from 1707 to 1783. Now, what could be further color from life and daily life? Numbers, things like factorizing a number into its prime constituents. You know that, for example, 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. That kind of prime factorization, it looks like something that only mathematicians would understand themselves with. In India, of course, very famously, Ramanujam was the mathematician who brought about the advances in prime number theory in the 20th century. But what good was it? Well, no, at Ramanujam's time, credit cards and internet banking obviously didn't exist. And if they did exist, it's likely that both Weiler and Ramanujam would have cared about them. They would have said, sorry, really, we are working with numbers. We are not interested in internet and banking. Hmm? But today, public key encryption, which is based on these ideas of prime numbers, is used to keep your online secrets safe. And this is the reason why you can enter your credit card details online. And uh, you can hope that at least if the system works as it's supposed to work, then your data, uh, your data are safe. 
Now, I don't have time to explain public key encryption, but it's a lovely subject. Some of you may already know about it. Those who don't should again go to Wikipedia and look it up. But I wonder if you know this Indian mathematician. Do you? Hand up please if you know him. No, I don't think you know him. This is Manindra Agar from IIT Kanpur. And uh, in the year 2001, uh, he and his two undergrad students wrote this fabulous paper called Primes is in P, which says we present an unconditional deterministic polynomial time algorithm that determines whether an input number is prime or composite. Okay, It shows uh, a certain property of how, my, how difficult it is to determine the prime factorization of a number and that is related to how difficult it is to break somebody's password. Not directly related, it's a long process between this fundamental maths and the process of breaking passwords. Okay, But just to show you that a pure mathematician uh, along with undergrad students could make a breakthrough in a problem which had been around for many decades before that. And it's a matter of great pride and it's also something, you know, uh, surprising that in India we keep talking about our past but we don't seem to talk about some of the great discoveries which have taken place in our own life times. Even we people were born in 2001. Hmm? Okay, now there are many more examples. I'll just list a few. Microwaves uh, and their relation to mobile phones, radon transform which is a mathematical technique, its relation to magnetic resonance or MRI, uh, radioactivity leads to surgical techniques like the gamma knife, uh, Raman spectroscopy leads to medical treatments. By the way, this is very, very important. Raman spectroscopy is a very important medical tool today, today even as we talk. Evolution and genetic to diabetes treatment. Particle accelerators have led to the World Wide Web, what we call www when we type in a URL. Uh, this came, this was originated at CERN, which is a particle accelerator laboratory in Geneva for handling of their own data. Okay. So I hope I've made a certain amount of case for the relevance of irrelevant science uh, in society. And now I'd actually like to pause and I'll unshare my screen and I would like if you are if you have a little time. Uh, I'm at least I have a little time. I am happy to uh, chat with you um, and take your questions. If only I can unshare the screen, which is not very easy for some reason. Give me a second, yeah. Uh, stop sharing screen. Good. Okay, so you could put on your mic now and uh, can you see me? Yes sir. yes, sir. Okay, I can't hear anyone. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you want to run yes, sir. that mic? Yeah, good. Okay. Good. I okay, so please, uh, anything you want. How can a student from engineering background can benefit himself yes. or herself in, in the field of relevant or irrelevant science? Okay, how can a student of engineering background benefit himself or herself from what? From relevant science or irrelevant science? Irrelevant or relevant science. Uh, I don't think it's about benefiting yourself. I think it, you know, I just want you to be aware that the things which you use are coming from science which was originally done not for application but to understand the deep structure of nature. And this doesn't mean that your work is less important or that work is less important. It means that it's like a chain. It's a chain of events that first some thought comes from a scientist who is looking at some basic system then that what is converted into a device, then that device is converted into an application, then the application has to be converted into a marketable form and a useful form. So many steps on the way. And the point I want to emphasize is that we should understand this chain of events. Now, uh, maybe one answer where I can answer your question is that when I continue with the remaining 5-10 minutes of my talk, I'll show you some of the basic science uh, developments which are going on now. So these might be useful 20 years from now when you people are at the peak of your career and you might be able to make some useful applications from them. But you have to be very patient and you have to have a lot of depth. Okay, so I'll come to that. There was also a question about gravity and GPS. What yes, was sir, that yes, question? Sir. Yes, sir. 
sir, how is gravitation? I'm um, uh, how it is uh, affecting the GPS system, or how it is working gravitation? How is gravitation affecting GPS system? Very good. That's a good question. And uh, the answer is this: What is GPS after all? It's a global positioning system, right? So there's a satellite. The satellite gets data from the Earth, and it beams data back to the Earth. Okay, and that beaming data from the satellite is picked up by your mobile phone and that's how your Google Maps works. Now, what is that beaming? When we beam data, what do we actually beam? What is being sent? How is the data sent? Sending the forms of waves, no, sir. Satellites. Uh -huh. Waves, sending... that's right. What kind of waves? Electromagnetic waves, right? Okay, sir. Yeah. Now, Electromagnetic waves or light waves, they can be any frequency, they are all electromagnetic waves. They bend in the presence of a heavy object. Okay, so because the heavy object has, has a gravitational field that causes light to bend. This is one of the famous results of Einstein's theory of relativity was that light bends when it passes by a heavy object. So light doesn't actually travel in straight lines. Maybe you were taught travel in straight lines. But it doesn't. Now, question is what is the exact, okay, it almost travels in straight lines unless there's a very, very heavy object nearby. But in the case of GPS signals, you see the whole earth is there and there will be a tiny bending. The point is, the magnitude of that bending is enough to mess up your GPS uh, positioning uh, in fine detail. And you see, if I'm going to a particular place, let's say I'm going to a restaurant or a movie theater, if GPS takes me kilometers away, then it's no use. It has to take me really to that place. And without knowing general relativity corrections, I wouldn't be able to get the correct data and people would not use GPS. It simply won't be useful as a tool anymore. But nobody imagined that such a theory as general theory of relativity can have an application which an ordinary citizen holding a mobile phone can use. But your phone is doing that calculation. Your phone is not doing the calculation, but Google Maps is doing the calculation for you. Because Google Maps is a software which is telling you where you are and what are the surroundings near you. And to do that calculation starting from GPS signal, it to know the level. Okay, I can continue then. Uh, what I'll do, I'll just continue for 10 minutes. I just want sure. to apply the things for the picture and then I'll wind up. Okay? Sure. So again, I'm going to share my um, uh, screen. And I want to, here I want to highlight, okay, is the screen working now? Yes, sir, it's working. Okay, good. It's good. And you can keep your mic on because I'm not getting feedback. So I'm quite happy. So, what are the things which happened in the 20th century which led to the, uh, the situation today? These are some of the basic discoveries. Quantum theory, nuclear and particle physics, special and general relativity, condensed matter and material science. These are all topics of physics. Then theory of evolution, and genetics, these are topics of biology, number theory in mathematics. There could be many others, I have just listed the, the, what I consider the most important ones. If you think about all the applications I discussed, one way or the other they come from one of these. Advanced geometry also. In fact, advanced geometry is relevant for Einstein's theory of general relativity. So, if we want to know about the future, the future when you people will be working, and it is your future where you will be actually doing new things. Uh, what are seeds of this for tomorrow? And these are my guesses. So I think that the work going on today in connects matter to understand superconductivity and magnetism will have a powerful impact on society in the future. Already you know there are things called magnetic trains, rotating trains and so on. But I think with better understanding of superconductivity, could have much more uh, radical application. For example, cars uh, and buses might completely redesign. They might superconducting. They might work in a different way. Be energy efficient. Atomic and molecular physics and quantum information. You know that quantum information would be useful to build a quantum computer, which would be more powerful than existing classical computers. 
elementary particle physics which deals with the particles like neutrinos, Higgs particles, maybe super particles. We don't know what use these are, but I believe that they can be useful in the future in ways that we can't imagine right now. Astrophysics has concepts called dark matter and dark energy. These also are highly abstract today, but they may be more practical. Similarly, in quantum gravity, we have concepts like black holes and string theory in which I work. And these also might lead to future progress in practical applied engineering fields. And here are some applications that people are already talking about. I don't know details, but I've made a list for you. Active capsule endoscopy. I think this is the idea that in medicine, you insert some active capsule into the body, and when it's inside, it does the way it jobs like taking readings. You know that endoscopy is trying to see the inside of the body, but instead of putting a probe inside, maybe you swallow a pill and the pill has a camera in it. It's very, it's very plausible. Robotic surgery. You know that by this, a doctor can perform surgery being in a different city uh, and using a robot and a computer to perform surgery in a different place. Telemedicine, I think this is the same idea. Then something for notes, National Orifice Transluminal Endoscopic Surgery, you should look this up. Uh, self -propel. These are all medical applications which I hear people talking about. Photodynamic cancer therapy and virtual reality. Okay, So these, most of these if you see in this list are in the field of medicine. And medicine is the field which is moving very fast because look, there's a demand. Human beings want to be cured of disease. Human beings don't like to be sick. Human beings don't like to die. And they like that science should be used for their benefit. But personally, I believe that the really striking applications may not be any of these. They may come from discoveries that have just been made or which are now being made in places like Iser Pune where I work. Uh, in labs over here, in labs in our fundamental science institutions and it's important to watch these places to see what they are doing which can then be useful uh, later on to develop applied technologies. So actually this is pretty much all I wanted to say in this talk and um, uh, if you want I could say more words or if you want I can stop here and I, 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 I personally prefer more of discussion and uh, interaction. So, uh, I think maybe the best thing is I'll stop here and uh, if you are in a mood, you can chat for 5 or 10 minutes more and then I'll go and you can go back to your uh, festival, which I hope is going well. Hmm? Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions? Hello, sir. I have to ask, uh, basically, uh, what is that uh, string theory in uh, quantum gravity? String theory. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll give you a five minute summary of what is string theory. I have it prepared. I wasn't sure if there was interest, but since there is interest, I'll give you a five minute summary. Hmm? I have my slides, so I'll it. Okay. So this is some comments on quantum gravity, just for five minutes. Now, you know, gravity is the oldest known force in nature because we all experience it. Okay. You don't experience clear interactions most of the time. You may not electromagnetic interactions, but if you jump, even if you just jump off your chair, you will experience gravity. But it's a very weak force, and actually here's a nice little picture to show that. There are two electrons. The gravitational force between them, relative to the electromagnetic force, is 10 to the minus 42. You can imagine how much difference there is in the strength of these two forces. Okay. Now, why do we know gravity at all? Because the universe is full of huge electrically neutral objects like planets and stars. And being large, they magnify the gravitational force, but being neutral, they don't experience a net electromagnetic force. So this is the reason why we know about gravity. But the problem is, to fit in with the picture that we have about the rest of physics, gravitation should be described by quantum theory. And this gravity, which I told you about, Einstein, is what is called a classical theory. It doesn't make use of quantum ideas. It doesn't make use of the principle that microscopically the world is quantum. And experimentally, it's very difficult to test gravity in the limit where the quantum behavior is visible. 
<coughs> the question is could quantum gravity be tested? Now theoretically we know that if there is quantum gravity it must have massless particle called the graviton which is like a photon, the particle of light but it has a higher spin as a spin of two units rather than one. And you know, we detect gravity excitations in the form of gravitational waves just like we detect radiation in the form of light or electromagnetic waves. But as you know, when we detect light, we find particle-like behavior, but when we detect gravitational waves, so far we cannot see the graviton-like behavior because it's simply too weak. This is the because the gravitational force is so weak that experiments are very difficult, almost impossible. It was great that we could detect gravitational waves at all. Now people think that these quantum effects of gravity might be visible in the early universe and they might be visible uh, by looking at experiments on space probes with study cosmology, the cosmic microwave background of the universe. So that's nice. This is an experimental possibility and it may happen during our lifetimes. The question is, how do we know what we should compare with those experiments? What is the theory of quantum gravity which we compare with experiments? Now, general relativity becomes mathematically inconsistent at very high energies. It only works at the energy at which we exist and we operate. This has been a problem since Einstein's time. What is the correct theory which is mathematically consistent at high energy, but also it's equivalent to relativity at low energy? And this theory would have to be some kind of new generalization of Einstein's theory. And today, many of us believe that the correct theory is called string theory. And in string theory, fundamental particles arise as the different excitation modes of a relativistic string. So, fundamental particles are replaced by fundamental strings. And at low energies, one sees only the low vibration modes of the string. And one can calculate the behavior of these modes and prove that they satisfy Einstein's equations of general relativity. So the string theory at low energy does reduce to general relativity, but at high energy it departs from it and it is consistent unlike Einstein's theory. And one finds a very beautiful picture of string interactions which I will show you in this little animation. Imagine I have two strings which are going to scatter and interact. They form this kind of surface and transform into outgoing strings uh, and this is a model for how elementary particle interactions actually take place and if you study this model mathematically you find that it doesn't have any of the difficulties at high energy which Einstein's theory has and this is why we believe that this be the, uh, uh, the theory of the future and that it could be a convergence between cosmology experiments and string theory uh, mathematics. This is the basic hope uh, and this could be the seed of new applications in the future but as I said at the beginning, this is a tree in whose shade we will not sit. So that's my little uh, summary of string theory and uh, I hope you got the basic idea which is that it's a new, uh, relatively new proposal not yet experimentally tested uh, to finish quantum gravity. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Yes, I see a hand at the back. Uh, good, good morning, sir. Sir, could you please uh, throw some light on the concept of space-time? It's a space-time theory. Thank, thank you. That's a very nice question. Can I throw some light on the concept of space-time? That's a very, very uh, interesting and difficult question, but let me uh, try to throw a little light on it. So, um, you know, of course, you know, we think that we know what is space. So, we know that we have forward, backward, up, down, left, right, three independent dimensions of space. And uh, try to imagine now that space is not flat, but curved. Now, you can't really imagine curved three-dimensional space because we are living in it. So, try to imagine curved two-dimensional space. Okay. For that, I will ask you to look at a tube. If I have a tube here in my desk, maybe I ah, here is a tube. Here is a tube. Okay, it's a roll of paper. Okay. Now this surface, it's a two-dimensional space, and imagine that I have I am a little ant which is walking on this. 
okay how will the ant know that this is not a normal space the ant of course can move forward backward and it can also move left and right but the ant will find that if it starts to walk this way it goes round the tube and after some time walking only in one direction it comes back where it started okay so that's a very weird thing and that can only happen when the space is curved or curled up so this kind of space is we call it non trivial it's very different from the flat space which you get if you just unroll the sheet of paper so that's curved space now you have to imagine that our three dimensions space could be curved it's very difficult to visualize but mathematically it's very well defined and experiments of uh, cosmology which i have been telling you they do try to find out whether the world we live in is curved but einstein found something else which is really even more dramatic he found that we need to assume that space and time are curved among themselves which means by a change of point of view what looks like space to me will look like time now that's really very strange but in fact if you think a little bit it's not that strange the change of point of view is called going into a moving frame so einstein used to imagine that he is sitting in a train or a bus or a tram and the tram is moving very very fast with respect to people on the ground and he realized that you can explain the behavior of physics of light if you assume that when an object is moving very fast therefore it's in a different frame of reference from stationary object then the concept of time and space in that moving frame get mixed up with each other and that is the concept of space time now it's really difficult to visualize we cannot see space time we are in space time we cannot see it from outside but there are simple equations the equations of special relativity which tell us exactly how a fast moving object gets uh, its space and time mixed up and there are nice experimental consequences for example uh, you might have heard of particles called muons mu mesons these are there in cosmic rays so right now where you are in sikkim cosmic rays are passing through your auditorium uh, all the time okay also where i am in pune cosmic rays are passing through me and among these rays are muons now muons have a very peculiar property they decay quite fast in matter of few minutes but the muons in cosmic rays decay much slower and the reason is that they are moving very fast and their notion of time is different from my notion of time they suffer from time dilation and experimentally we know that it happens because if muons were decaying at a normal rate they would have decayed before entering our atmosphere but they are entering our atmosphere so obviously moving muons are decaying more slowly than stationary muons okay and this is an example of time dilation and time dilation means that for a moving muon in its own frame of reference time and space have been mixed up so it takes longer time to accomplish the same thing which it would accomplish if it was at rest now i realize this is not an explanation it takes one semester to teach uh, at least take half a semester to teach special relativity and more than one semester to teach general relativity so these are very difficult subjects but i want to tell you you can always read wikipedia and you will get some idea what is going on i always tell students please 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 read wikipedia don't look down on it as some second rate reference it's a very good reference it has the basic info and you will learn something from that so please do that thank you so much sir any more further questions sir a little bit introduction of orbifolds of m theory so you done research in tifa yeah yeah that is true but you know orbifolds of m theory i think it's a bit inappropriate because i don't like to talk about things which i can't explain and i can't explain m theory in 5 uh, minutes or 10 minutes and that's all i have hmm? i gave you a little summary of string theory however and if you want you could still go to wikipedia and read what is m theory but i also want to emphasize these are speculative theories these are not theories which have been verified by experiments and one should try to focus more on those theories which have some direct experimental relevance especially from your point of view because those are the theories which it they might lead to some device or some application which you can actually use hmm. 
It may be that in future string theory and M theory also do that, but that will be very far in the future, probably not in your lifetime. So I would advise you to focus on interesting things like neutrino physics. Neutrino physics is a really, really amazing subject because in the same cosmic rays and in fact in the, in the stream of radiation passing through all of you right now, millions, if you just hold out your palm, millions of neutrinos are passing through it every second. They are very fascinating particles and we understand uh, them much better now. Uh, even 10 years ago, we didn't have a very good understanding of neutrinos. Uh, you might have heard of the Higgs particle that was discovered by a fantastic experiment in, in CERN in, at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago. These are things I think you should read up on. You can think of it as, you know, from your point of view as engineers, you can think about it as some extracurricular reading which will give you some inspiration. And that's also the motivation with which I have given you this talk. That it's some extracurricular activity, not part of your main activity, but it may give you some hope, some aspiration and some idea what you can try to hope for the future that things will really come out from basic science into applied science.